During his frequent visits to Thumba, Professor Sarabadi would openly review the progress of work with the entire team. He never gave directions. Rather, through a free exchange of views, he led us forward into new terrain which often revealed an unforeseen solution. Perhaps he was aware that though a particular goal might be clear to himself, and he could give adequate directions for its accomplishment, his team members might have resisted working towards a goal that made no sense to them. He considered the collective understanding of the problem the main attribute of effective leadership. He once told me, look, my job is to make decisions, but it is equally important to see to it that these decisions are accepted by my team members. In fact, Professor Sarabadi took a series of decisions that were to become the life mission of many. We would make our own rockets, our own satellite launch vehicles, SLVs, and our own satellites. And this would not be done one by one but concurrently, in a multidimensional fashion. In the development of payloads for the sounding rockets, instead of getting a certain payload and then engineering it to fit into the rocket, we discussed the matter threadbare with the payload scientists working in different organizations and at different locations. I may even say that the most significant achievement of the sounding rocket program was to establish and maintain nationwide mutual trust. Perhaps realizing that I preferred to persuade people to do as they were told rather than use my legitimate authority, Professor Sarabadi assigned me the task of providing interface support to payload scientists. Almost. All physical laboratories in India were involved in the sounding rocket program, each having its own mission, its own objective and its own payload. These payloads were required to be integrated to the rocket structure so as to ensure their proper functioning and endurance under flight conditions. We had X-ray payloads to look at stars, payloads fitted with radio frequency mass spectrometers to analyze the gas composition of the upper atmosphere, sodium payloads to find out wind conditions, its direction, and velocity. We also had ionospheric payloads to explore different layers of the atmosphere. I not only had to interact with scientists from TIFR, National Physical Laboratory, NPL, and Physical Research Laboratory, PRL, but also with payload scientists from USA, USSR, France, Germany, and Japan. I often read Khalil Gibran, and always find his words full of wisdom. Bread baked without love is a bitter bread that feeds but half a man's hunger, those who cannot work with their hearts achieve but a hollow, half-hearted success that breeds bitterness all around. If you are a writer who would secretly prefer to be a lawyer or a doctor, your written words will feed but half the hunger of your readers, if you are a teacher who would rather be a businessman, your instructions will meet but half the need for knowledge of your students, if you are a scientist who hates science, your performance will satisfy but half the needs of your mission. The personal unhappiness and failure to achieve results that comes from being a round peg in a square hole is not, by any means, new. But there are exceptions to this like Professor Oda and Sudhakar, who bring to their work a personal touch of magic based upon their individual character, personality, inner motives, and perhaps the dreams crystallized within their hearts. They become so emotionally involved with their work that any dilution of the success of their effort fills them with grief. Prof. Oda was an X-ray payload scientist from the Institute of Space and Aeronautical Sciences, ISAS, Japan. I remember him as a diminutive man with a towering personality and eyes that radiated intelligence. His dedication to his work was exemplary. He would bring X-ray payloads from ISAS, which along with the X-ray payloads made by Professor U. R. Rao, would be engineered by my team to fit into the nose cone of the Rohini rocket. At an altitude of 150 kilometers, the nose cone would be separated by explosion of pyros triggered by an electronic timer. With this, the X-ray sensors would be exposed to space for collecting the required information about the emissions from stars. Together, Professor Oda and Professor Rao were a unique blend of intellect and dedication, which one rarely sees. One day, when I was working on the integration for Professor Oda's payload with my timer devices, he insisted on using the timers he had brought from Japan. To me they looked flimsy, 
but Professor Oda stuck to his stand that the Indian timers be replaced by the Japanese ones. I yielded to his suggestion and replaced the timers. The rocket took off elegantly and attained the intended altitude. But the telemetry signal reported mission failure on account of timer malfunction. Professor Oda was so upset that tears welled up in his eyes. I was stunned. By the emotional intensity of Professor Oda's response. He had clearly put his heart and soul into his work. Sudhakar was my colleague in the payload preparation laboratory. As part of the pre-launch schedule, we were filling and remotely pressing the hazardous sodium and thermite mix. As usual, it was a hot and humid day at Thumba. After the sixth such operation, Sudhakar and I went into the payload room to confirm the proper filling of the mix. Suddenly, a drop of sweat from his forehead fell onto the sodium, and before we knew what was happening, there was a violent explosion which shook the room. For a few paralysed seconds, I did not know what to do. The fire was spreading, and water would not extinguish the sodium fire. Trapped in this inferno, Sudhakar, however, did not lose his presence of mind. He broke the glass window with his bare hands and literally threw me out to safety before jumping out himself. I touched Sudhakar's bleeding hands in gratitude, he was smiling through his pain. Sudhakar spent many weeks in the hospital recuperating from the severe burns he had received. At Turles, I was involved with rocket preparation activities, payload assembly, testing, and evaluation besides building subsystems like payload housing and jettisonable nose cones. Working with the nose cones led me, as a natural consequence, into the field of composite materials. It is interesting to know that the bows found, during archaeological excavations at different sites in the country, reveal that Indians used composite bows made of wood, sinew, and horn as early as the 11th century, at least 500 years before such bows were made in medieval Europe. The versatility of composites, in the sense that they possess very desirable structural, thermal, electrical, chemical, and mechanical properties, fascinated me. I was so enthused with these man-made materials that I was in a hurry to know everything about them almost overnight. I used to read up everything available on related topics. I was particularly interested in the glass and carbon fiber reinforced plastic, FRP, composites. An FRP composite is composed of an inorganic fiber woven into a matrix that encloses it and gives the component its bulk form. In February 1969, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi visited Thumba to dedicate Turles to the international space science community. On this occasion, she commissioned the country's first filament winding machine in our laboratory. This event brought my team, which included C. R. Satya, P. N. Subramanian, and M. N. Satyanarayana, great satisfaction. We made high-strength glass cloth laminates to build non-magnetic payload housings and flew them in two-stage sounding rockets. We also wound and test flew rocket motor casings of up to 360 mm diameter. Slowly, but surely, two Indian rockets were born at Thumba. They were christened Rohini and Manaka, after the two mythological dancers. In the court of Indra, the king of the sky. The Indian payloads no longer needed to be launched by French rockets. Could this have been done but for the atmosphere of trust and commitment which Professor Sarabhai had created at Incospar? He brought into use each person's knowledge and skills. He made every man feel directly involved in problem solving. By the very fact of the team members' participation, the solutions became genuine and earned the trust of the entire team resulting in total commitment towards implementation. Professor Sarabhai was matter of fact and never tried to hide his disappointment. He used to talk with us in an honest and objective manner. Sometimes I found him making things look more positive than they actually were, and then charming us by his almost magical powers of persuasion. When we were at the drawing board, he would bring someone from the developed world for a technical collaboration. That was his subtle way of challenging each one of us to stretch our capabilities. At the same time, even if we failed to meet certain objectives, he would praise whatever we had accomplished. 
whenever he found any one of us going over his head and attempting a task for which he did not have the capability or skill, Professor Sarabhai would reassign activity in such a way so as to lower pressure and permit better quality work to be performed. By the time the first Rohini 75 rocket was launched from Turles on November 20, 1967, almost each one of us was in his own groove. Early next year, Professor Sarabhai wanted to see me urgently in Delhi. By now I was accustomed to Professor Sarabhai's working methods. He was always full of enthusiasm and optimism. In such a state of mind, sudden flashes of inspiration were almost natural. On reaching Delhi, I contacted Professor Sarabhai's secretary for an appointment and was asked to meet him at 3.30 a.m. at Hotel Ashoka. Delhi being a slightly unfamiliar place, with an unfriendly climate for someone like me, conditioned to the warm and humid climate of South India, I decided to wait in the hotel lounge after finishing my dinner. I have always been a religious person in the sense that I maintain a working partnership with God. I was aware that the best work required more ability than I possessed and therefore I needed help that only God could give me. I made a true estimate of my own ability, then raised it by 50 per center and put myself in God's hands. In this partnership, I have always received all the power I needed, and in fact have actually felt it flowing through me. Today, I can affirm that the kingdom of God is within you in the form of this power, to help achieve your goals and realize your dreams. There are many different types and levels of experience that turn this internal power reaction critical. Sometimes, when we are ready, the gentlest of contacts with him fills us with insight and wisdom. This could come from an encounter with another person, from a word, a question, a gesture, or even a look. Many a time, it could come even through a book, a conversation, some phrase, even a line from a poem or the mere sight of a picture. Without the slightest warning, something new breaks into your life and a secret decision is taken, a decision that you may be completely unconscious of, to start with. I looked around the elegant lounge. Somebody had left a book on a nearby sofa. As if to fill the small hours of that cold night with some warm thoughts, I picked up the book and started browsing. I must have turned only a few pages of the book, about which I do not remember a thing today. It was some popular book related to business management. I was not really reading it, only skimming over paragraphs and turning pages. Suddenly, my eyes fell on a passage in the book, it was a quotation from George Bernard Shaw. The gist of the quote was that all reasonable men adapt themselves to the world. Only a few unreasonable ones persist in trying to adapt the world to themselves. All progress in the world depends on these unreasonable men and their innovative and often nonconformist actions. I started reading the book from the Bernard Shaw passage onwards. The author was describing certain myths woven around the concept and the process of innovation in industry and business. I read about the myth of strategic planning. It is generally believed that substantial strategic and technological planning greatly increases the odds of a no surprises outcome. The author was of the opinion that it is essential for a project manager to learn to live with uncertainty and ambiguity. He felt that it was a myth to hold that the key to economic success is computability. A quotation from General George Patton was given as a counterpoint to this myth that a good plan violently executed right now is far better than a perfect plan executed next week. It is a myth that to win big one must strive to optimize, the author felt. Optimization wins only on paper, but would invariably lose later in the real world, the book said. Waiting in the hotel lobby at 1 a.m. for an appointment two hours later was certainly not a reasonable proposition, neither for me nor for Professor Sarabhai. But then, Professor Sarabhai had always exhibited a strong component of unorthodoxy in his character. He was running the show of space research in the country understaffed, overworked nevertheless in a successful manner. Suddenly, I became aware of another man who came and sat down. On the sofa opposite mine. He was a well-built person with an intelligent look and refined posture. Unlike me always disorderly in my dress this man was wearing elegant clothes. 
notwithstanding the odd hours. He was alert and vivacious. There was a strange magnetism about him which derailed the train. Of my thoughts on innovation. And before I could get back to the book. I was informed that Professor Sarabahi was ready to receive me. I left the book on the nearby sofa from where I had picked it up. I was surprised when the man sitting on the opposite sofa was also asked to come inside. Who was he? It was not long before my question was answered. Even before we sat down, Professor Sarabahi introduced us to each other. He was Group Captain V.S. Narayanan from Air Headquarters. Professor Sarabahi ordered coffee for both of us and unfolded his plan of developing a rocket-assisted takeoff system, RATO, for military aircraft. This would help our warplanes to take off from short runways in the Himalayas. Hot coffee was served over small talk. It was totally uncharacteristic of Professor Sarabahi. But as soon as we finished the coffee, Professor Sarabahi rose and asked us to accompany him to Tulpat Range on the outskirts of Delhi. As we were passing through the lobby, I threw a cursory glance at the sofa where I had left the book. It was not there. It was about an hour's drive to the range. Professor Sarabahi showed us. A Russian RATO. If I get you the motors of this system from Russia, could you do it in 18 months time? Professor Sarabahi asked us. Yes, we can. Both GP Cap VS Narayanan and I spoke almost simultaneously. Professor Sarabahi's face beamed, reflecting our fascination. I recalled what I had read, he will bestow on you a light to walk in. After dropping us back at the Hotel Ashoka, Professor Sarabahi went to the Prime Minister's house for a breakfast meeting. By that evening, the news of India taking up the indigenous development of a device to help short-run takeoffs by high-performance military aircraft, with myself heading the project, was made public. I was filled with many emotions happiness, gratitude, a sense of fulfillment and these lines from a little-known poet of the 19th century crossed my mind. For all your days prepare. And meet them ever alike. When you are the anvil, bear, when you are the hammer, strike. RATO motors were mounted on aircraft to provide the additional thrust required during the takeoff run under certain adverse operating conditions like partially bombed out runways, high altitude airfields, more than the prescribed load, or very high ambient temperatures. The Air Force was in dire need of a large number of RATO motors for their S-22 and HF-24 aircraft. The Russian RATO motor shown to us at the Tulpat range was capable of generating a 3,000 kg thrust with a total impulse of 24500 kg seconds. It weighed 220 kg and had a double base propellant encased in steel. The development work was to be carried out at the Space Science and Technology Center with the assistance of the Defense Research and Development Organization, DRDO, HAL, DTD and P, Air, and Air Headquarters. After a detailed analysis of the available options, I chose a fiberglass motor casing. We decided in favor of a composite propellant which gives a higher specific impulse and aimed at a longer burning time to utilize it completely. I also decided to take additional safety measures by incorporating a diaphragm which would rupture if the chamber pressure for some reason exceeded twice the operating pressure. Two significant developments occurred during the work on RATO. The first was the release of a 10-year profile for space research in the country, prepared by Professor Sarabai. This profile was not merely an activity plan laid down by the top man for his team to comply with, it was a theme paper meant for open discussions, to be later transformed into a program. In fact, I found it was the romantic manifesto of a person deeply in love with the space research program in his country. The plan mainly centered around the early ideas which had been born at Incospar, it included utilization of satellites for television and developmental education, meteorological observations and remote sensing for management of natural resources. To this had been added the development and launch of satellite launch vehicles. The active international cooperation dominant in the early years was virtually eased out in this plan and the emphasis was on self-reliance. 
and indigenous technologies. The plan talked about the realization of a SLV for injecting lightweight satellites into a low Earth orbit, upgrading of Indian satellites from laboratory models to space entities and development of a wide range of spacecraft subsystems like the Apogee and Booster Motors, Momentum Wheel and Solar Panel Deployment Mechanism. It also promised a wide range of technological spin-offs. Like the gyros, various types of transducers, telemetry, adhesives and polymers for non-space applications. Over and above, there was the dream of an adequate infrastructure that would be capable of supporting R&D in a variety of engineering and scientific disciplines. The second development was the formation of a missile panel in the Ministry of Defense. Both Narayanan and I were inducted as members. The idea of making missiles in our own country was exciting, and we spent hours on end studying the missiles of various advanced countries. The distinction between a tactical missile and a strategic missile is often a fine one. Generally, by strategic, it is understood that the missile will fly thousands of kilometers. However, in warfare, this term is used to denote the kind of target rather than its distance from missile launch. Strategic missiles are those that strike at the enemy's heartland, either in counter-force attacks on their strategic forces or in counter-value attacks on the society, which in essence means his cities. Tactical weapons are those that influence a battle, and the battle may be by land, sea, or air, or on all three together. This categorization now appears nonsensical, as the U.S. Air Force's ground-launched Tomahawk is used in a tactical role, notwithstanding its range of some 3,000 kilometers. In those days, however, strategic missiles were synonymous with intermediate-range ballistic missiles, IRBMs, with ranges in the order of 1,500 nautical miles or 2,780 kilometers and intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs, with the capability of going even further. GP Cap Narayanan had an ineffable enthusiasm for indigenous guided missiles. He was a great admirer of the strong arm approach of the Russian missile development program. When it could be done there, why not here, where space research has already prepared the soil for a bonanza of missile technology? Narayanan used to needle me. The bitter lessons of the two wars in 1962 and 1965 had left the Indian leadership with little choice in the matter of achieving self-reliance in military hardware and weapon systems. A large number of surface-to-air missiles, SAMs, were obtained from the USSR to guard strategic locations. GP Cap Narayanan passionately advocated the development of these missiles in the country. While working together on RATO motors and on the missile panel, Narayanan and I played the roles of student and teacher interchangeably wherever required. He was very eager to learn about rocketry and I was very curious to know about airborne weapon systems. The depth of Narayanan's conviction and his force of application were inspiring. Right from the day of our pre-dawn visit to the Tulpat range with Professor Sarabai, Narayanan was always busy with his RATO motor. He had arranged everything that was required before being asked. He obtained funding of 75 rupees locks with a further commitment towards any unforeseen costs. You name the thing and I will get it for you, but do not ask for time, he said. At times, I often laughed at his impatience, and read for him these lines from T.S. Eliot's Hollow Men. Between the conception and the creation between the emotion and the response falls the shadow. Defense R&D at that time was heavily dependent on imported equipment. Virtually nothing indigenous was available. Together, we made a long shopping list and drew up an import plan. But this made me unhappy was there no remedy or alternative? Was this nation doomed to live with screwdriver technology? Could a poor country like India afford this kind of development? One day, while working late in the office, which was quite routine after I took up the RATO projects, I saw a young colleague, Jayachandra Babu going home. Babu had joined us a few months ago and the only thing I knew about him was that he had a very positive attitude and was articulate. I called him into my office and did a bit of loud thinking. Do you have any suggestions? I then asked him. Babu remained silent for a while, 
and then asked for time until the next evening to do some homework before answering my question. The next evening, Baba came to me before the appointed time. His face was beaming with promise. We can do it, sir. The RATO system can be made without imports. The only hurdle is the inherent inelasticity in the approach of the organization towards procurement and subcontracting, which would be the two major thrust areas to avoid imports. He gave me seven points, or, rather, asked for seven liberties financial approval by a single person instead of an entire hierarchy, air travel for all people on work irrespective of their entitlement, accountability to only one person, lifting of goods by air cargo, subcontracting to the private sector, placement of orders on the basis of technical competence, and expeditious accounting procedures. These demands were unheard of in government establishments, which tend to be conservative, yet I could see the soundness of his proposition. The RATO project was a new game and there was nothing wrong if it was to be played with a new set of rules. I weighed all the pros and cons of Babu's suggestions for a whole night and finally decided to present them to Professor Sarabai. Hearing my plea for administrative liberalization and seeing the merits behind it, Professor Sarabadi approved the proposals without a second thought. Through his suggestions, Babu had highlighted the importance of business acumen in developmental work with high stakes. To make things move faster within existing work parameters, you have to pump in more people, more material and more money. If you can't do that, change your parameters. Instinctive businessman that he was, Babu did not remain long with us and left ISRO for greener pastures in Nigeria. I could never forget Babu's common sense in financial matters. We had opted for a composite structure for the RATO motor casing using filament fiberglass slash epoxy. We had also gone in for a high-energy composite propellant and an event-based ignition and jettisoning system in real time. A canted nozzle was designed to deflect the jet away from the aircraft. We conducted the first static test of RATO in the 12th month of the project initiation. Within the next four months, we conducted 64 static tests. And we were just about 20 engineers working on the project. The future satellite launch vehicle, SLV, had also been conceived by this time. Recognizing the immense socio-economic benefits of space technology, Professor Sarabadi decided in 1969, to go full steam ahead with the task of establishing indigenous capability in building and launching our own satellites. He personally participated in an aerial survey of the East Coast for a possible site for launching satellite launch vehicles and large rockets. Professor Sarabadi was concentrating on the East Coast in order to let the launch vehicle take full advantage of the Earth's west-to-east rotation. He finally selected the Shrihrikota Island, 100 kilometers north of Madras, now Chennai, and thus the Shah rocket launch station was born. The crescent-shaped island has a maximum width of 8 kilometers and lies alongside the coastline. The island is as big as Madras City. The Buckingham Canal and the Pulakat Lake form its western boundary. In 1968, we had formed the Indian Rocket Society. Soon after, the Incospar was reconstituted as an advisory body under the Indian National Science Academy, INSA, and the Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO, was created under the Department of Atomic Energy, DAY, to conduct space research in the country. By this time, Professor Sarabadi had already handpicked a team to give form to his dream of an Indian SLV. I consider myself fortunate to have been chosen to be a project leader. Professor Sarabadi gave me the additional responsibility of designing the fourth stage of the SLV. Dr. V. R. Gowariker, Mr. Kurup, and A. E. Muthanayagam were given the tasks of designing the other three stages. What made Professor Sarabadi pick a few of us for this great mission, one reason seemed to be our professional background. Dr. Gowariker was doing outstanding work in the field of composite propellants. Mr. Kurup had established an excellent laboratory for propellants, propulsion, and pyrotechnics. Muthanayagam had proved himself in the field of high-energy propellants. 
The fourth stage was to be a composite structure and called for a large number of innovations in fabrication technology, perhaps that was why I was brought in. I laid the foundation for stage 4 on two rocks sensible approximation and unawed support. I have always considered the price of perfection prohibitive and allowed mistakes as a part of the learning process. I prefer a dash of daring and persistence to perfection. I have always supported learning on the part of my team members by paying vigilant attention to each of their attempts, be they successful or unsuccessful. In my group, progress was recognized and reinforced at every tiny step. Although I provided access to all the information that my co-workers in stage 4 needed, I found I could not spend enough time to be a useful facilitator and a source of support. I wondered if there was something wrong with the way in which I managed my time. At this stage, Professor Sarabai brought a French visitor to our work center to point out the problem to me. This gentleman was Professor Curian, president of CNE's Centre National d'Etudes Spatiales, our counterpart in France. They were then developing the Diamond launch vehicles. Professor Curian was a thorough professional. Together, Professor Sarabai and Professor Curian helped me set a target. While they discussed the means by which I could reach it, they also cautioned me about the possibilities of failure. While I arrived at a better awareness of stage 4 problems through the supportive counseling of Professor Curian, Professor Sarabai's catalytic intervention led Professor Curian to reinterpret his own progress in the Diamond program. Professor Curian advised Professor Sarabai to relieve me of all the minor jobs which posed little challenge and to give me more opportunities for achievement. He was so impressed by our well-planned efforts that he inquired if we could make the Diamond's fourth stage. I recall how this brought a subtle smile to Professor Sarabai's face. As a matter of fact, the Diamond and SLV airframes were incompatible. The diameters were quite different and to attain interchangeability, some radical innovations were required. I wondered where I should start. I decided to look around for solutions among my own colleagues. I used to carefully observe my colleagues to see if their daily routine reflected their desire to constantly experiment. I also started asking and listening to anyone who showed the slightest promise. Some of my friends cautioned me about what they termed as my naivete. I made it an unfailing routine to make notes on individual suggestions and gave handwritten notes to colleagues in engineering and design requesting concrete follow-up action within 5 or 10 days. This method worked wonderfully well. Professor Curian testified, while reviewing our progress, that we had achieved in a year's time what our counterparts in Europe could barely manage in three years. Our plus point, he noted, was that each of us worked with those below and above in the hierarchy. I made it a point to have the team meet at least once every week. Though it took up time and energy, I considered it essential. How good is a leader? No better than his people and their commitment and participation in the project as full partners. The fact that I got them all together to share whatever little development had been achieved results, experiences, small successes and the like seemed to me worth putting all my energy and time into. It was a very small price to pay for that commitment and sense of teamwork, which could in fact be called trust. Within my own small group of people I found leaders, and learned that leaders exist at every level. This was another important aspect of management that I learned. We had modified the existing SLV4 stage design to suit the Diamond airframe. It was reconfigured and upgraded from a 250 kg, 400 mm diameter stage to a 600 kg, 650 mm diameter stage. After two years' effort, when we were about to deliver it to CNEs, the French suddenly cancelled their Diamond BC program. They told us that they did not need our stage 4 anymore. It was a great shock, making me relive. The earlier disappointments at Denradun, when I failed to get into the Air Force, and at Bangalore, when the Nandi project was aborted at aid. I had invested great hope and effort in the fourth stage, so that it could be flown with a Diamond rocket. The other three stages of SLV, involving enormous work in the area of rocket propulsion were at least five years away. However, 
it did not take me long to shelve the disappointment of Diamond BC Stage 4. After all, I had thoroughly enjoyed working on this project. In time, RATO filled the vacuum created in me by the Diamond BC Stage. When the RATO project was underway, the SLV project slowly started taking shape. Competence for all major systems of a launch vehicle had been established in Thumbo by now. Through their outstanding efforts, Vasanth Gowariker, Mr. Kurup, and Muthanayagam prepared turtles. For a big leap in rocketry. Professor Sarabadi was an exemplar in the art of team building. On one occasion, he had to identify a person who could be given the responsibility for developing a telecommand system for the SLV. Two men were competent to carry out this task one was the seasoned and sophisticated U.R. Rao and the other was a relatively unknown experimenter, G. Mothvan Nair. Although I was deeply impressed by Mothvan Nair's dedication and abilities, I did not rate his chances as very good. During one of Professor Sarabadi's routine visits, Mothvan Nair boldly demonstrated his improvised but highly reliable telecommand system. Professor Sarabadi did not take much time to back the young experimenter in preference to an established expert. Mothvan Nair not only lived up to the expectations of his leader but even went beyond them. He was to later become the project director of the Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, PSLV. SLVs and missiles can be called first cousins, they are different in concept and purpose, but come from the same bloodline of rocketry. A massive missile development project had been taken up by DRDO at the Defense Research and Development Laboratory, DRDL, Hyderabad. As the pace of this surface-to-air missile development project increased, the frequency of the missile panel meetings and my interaction with GP Cap Narayanan also increased. In 1968, Professor Sarabadi came to Thumba on one of his routine visits. He was shown the operation of the nose cone jettisoning mechanism. As always, we were all anxious to share the results of our work with Professor Sarabadi. We requested Professor Sarabadi to formally activate the pyro system through a timer circuit. Professor Sarabadi smiled, and pressed the button. To our horror, nothing happened. We were dumbstruck. I looked at Pramod Kale, who had designed and integrated the timer circuit. In a flash each of us mentally went through an analysis of the failure. We requested Professor Sarabadi to wait for a few minutes, then we detached. The timer device, giving direct connection to the Pyros. Professor Sarabadi pressed the button again. The Pyros were fired and the nose cone was jettisoned. Professor Sarabadi congratulated Kale and me, but his expression suggested that his thoughts were elsewhere. We could not guess what was on his mind. The suspense did not last for long and I got a call from Professor Sarabadi's secretary to meet him after dinner for an important discussion. Professor Sarabadi was staying at the Kovalam Palace Hotel, his usual home whenever he was in Trivandrum. I was slightly perplexed by the summons. Professor Sarabadi greeted me with his customary warmth. He talked of the rocket launching station, envisaging facilities like launch pads, block houses, radar, telemetry and so on things which are taken for granted in Indian space research today. Then he brought up the incident that had occurred that morning. This was exactly what I had feared. My apprehension of a reproach from my leader, however, was unfounded. Professor Sarabadi did not conclude that the failure of the pyro timer circuit was the outcome of insufficient knowledge and lack of skill on the part of his people or of faulty understanding at the direction stage. He asked me instead, if we were unenthused by a job that did not pose sufficient challenge. He also asked me to consider if my work was possibly being affected by any problem of which I was hitherto unaware. He finally put his finger on the key issue. We lacked a single roof to carry out system integration of all our rocket stages and rocket systems. Electrical and mechanical integration work was going on with a significant phase difference both in time and in space. There was little effort to bring together the disparate work on electrical and mechanical integration. Professor Sarabadi spent the next hour in redefining our tasks, and, in the small hours of the morning, the decision to set up a rocket engineering section was taken. 
mistakes can delay or prevent the proper achievement of the objectives of individuals and organizations, but a visionary like Professor Sarabhai can use errors as opportunities to promote innovation and the development of new ideas. He was not especially concerned with the mistake in the timer circuit, least of all with pinning the blame for it. Professor Sarabhai's approach to mistakes rested on the assumption that they were inevitable but generally manageable. It was in the handling of the crises that arose as a consequence that talent could often be revealed. I later realized by experience, that the best way to prevent errors was to anticipate them. But this time, by a strange twist of fate, the failure of the timer circuit led to the birth of a rocket engineering laboratory. It was my usual practice to brief Professor Sarabhai after every missile panel meeting. After attending one such meeting in Delhi on December 30, 1971, I was returning to Trivandrum. Professor Sarabhai was visiting Thumba that very day to review the SLV design. I spoke to him on the telephone from the airport lounge about the salient points that had emerged at the panel meeting. He instructed me to wait at Trivandrum Airport after disembarking from the Delhi flight, and to meet him there before his departure for Bombay the same night. When I reached Trivandrum, a pall of gloom hung in the air. The aircraft ladder operator Cuddy told me in a choked voice that Professor Sarabhai was no more. He had passed away a few hours ago, following a cardiac arrest. I was shocked to the core, it had happened within an hour of our conversation. It was a great blow to me and a huge loss to Indian science. That night passed in preparations for airlifting Professor Sarabhai's body for the cremation in Ahmedabad. For five years, between 1966 to 1971, about 22 scientists and engineers had worked closely with Professor Sarabhai. All of them were later to take charge of important scientific projects. Not only was Professor Sarabhai a great scientist, but also a great leader. I still remember him reviewing. The bi-monthly progress of the design projects of SLV-3 in June 1970. Presentations on stages I-4 were arranged. The first three presentations went through smoothly. Mine was the last presentation. I introduced five of my team members who had contributed in various ways to the design. To everybody's surprise, each of them presented his portion of the work with authority and confidence. The presentations were discussed at length and the conclusion was that satisfactory progress had been made. Suddenly, a senior scientist who worked closely with Professor Sarabhai turned to me and inquired, Well, the presentations for your project were made by your team members based on their work. But what did you do for the project? That was the first time I saw Professor Sarabhai really annoyed. He told his colleague, You ought to know what project management is all about. We just witnessed an excellent example. It was an outstanding demonstration of teamwork. I have always seen a project leader as an integrator of people and that is precisely what Callum is. I consider Professor Sarabhai as the Mahatma Gandhi of Indian science generating leadership qualities in his team and inspiring them through both ideas and example. After an interim arrangement with Professor M. G. K. Menon at the helm, Professor Sudish Thuban was given the responsibility of heading ISRO. The whole complex at Thumba, which included Turles, the Space Science and Technology Center, SSTC, the RPP, the Rocket Fabrication Facility, RFF, and the Propellant Fuel Complex, PFC, were merged together to form an integrated space center and christened the Vikram Sarabhai Space Center, VSSC, as a tribute to the man to whom it owed its existence. The renowned metallurgist, Dr. Brahm Prakash, took over as the first director of VSSC. The RATO system was successfully tested on October 8, 1972 at Bareilly Air Force Station in Uttar Pradesh, when a high-performance Sukhoi-16 jet aircraft became airborne after a short run of 1,200 m, as against its usual run of 2 km. We used the 66th RATO motor in the test. The demonstration was watched by Air Marshal Shivdev Singh and Dr. B. D. Nag Chaudhary, then the scientific advisor to the defense minister. 
This effort was said to have saved approximately 4 rupees crores in foreign exchange. The vision of the industrialist scientist had finally borne fruit. Before taking up the responsibility of organizing space research in India and becoming the chairman of Incospar, Professor Sarabhai had established a number of successful industrial enterprises. He was aware that scientific research could not survive in isolation, away from industry. Professor Sarabhai founded Sarabhai Chemicals, Sarabhai Glass, Sarabhai Gaga Limited, Sarabhai Merck Limited, and the Sarabhai Engineering Group. His Vustik oil mills did pioneering work in the extraction of oil from oil's eds, manufacture of synthetic detergents and of cosmetics. He geared Standard Pharmaceuticals Limited to enable large-scale manufacture of penicillin, which was imported from abroad at astronomical costs at that time. Now with the indigenization of RATO, his mission had acquired a new dimension independence in the manufacture of military hardware and the potential saving of crores of rupees in foreign exchange. I recalled this on the day of the successful trial of the RATO system. Including trial expenses, we spent less than 25 rupees locks on the entire project. The Indian RATO could be produced at 17,000 rupees apiece, and it replaced the imported RATO, which cost 33,000 rupees. At the Vikram Sarabhai Space Center, work on the SLV went on at full swing. All the subsystems had been designed, technologies identified, processes established, work centers selected, manpower earmarked, and schedules drawn. The only hitch was the lack of a management structure to effectively handle this mega project and coordinate activities which were spread over a large number of work centers with their own ways of working and management. Professor Thavan, in consultation with Dr. Brahm Prakash, picked me for this job. I was appointed the project manager SLV, and reported directly to the director, VSSC. My first task was to work out a project management plan. I wondered why I was selected for this task when there were stalwarts like Gaurikar, Muthanayagam, and Kura Parand. With organizers like Iswardash, Aravamudan, and S.C. Gupta available, how would I do better? I articulated my doubts to Dr. Brahm Prakash. He told me not to focus on what I saw as other people's strengths compared to my own, but instead, to attempt to expand their abilities. Dr. Brahm Prakash advised me to take care of the performance degraders and cautioned me against outrightly seeking optimal performance from the participating work centers. Everyone will work. To create their bit of SLV, your problem is going to be your dependency on others in accomplishing the total SLV. The SLV mission will be accomplished with, and through, a large number of people. You will require a tremendous amount of tolerance and patience, he said. It reminded me of what my father used to read to me from the Holy Quran on the distinction between right and wrong, we have sent no apostle before. You who did not eat or walk about the market squares. We test you by means of one another. Will you not have patience? I was aware of the contradiction that often occurred in such situations. People heading teams often have one of the following two orientations, for some, work is the most important motivation, for others, their workers are the all-consuming interest. There are many others who fall either between these two positions or outside them. My job was going to be to avoid those who were interested neither in the work nor in the workers. I was determined to prevent people from taking either extreme, and to promote conditions where work and workers went together. I visualized my team as a group in which each member worked to enrich the others. In the team and experience the enjoyment of working together. The primary objectives of the SLV project were design, development and operation of a standard SLV system, SLV-3, capable of reliably and expeditiously fulfilling the specified mission of launching a 40-kilogram satellite into a 400-kilometer circular orbit around the Earth. As a first step, I translated the primary project objectives into some major tasks. One such task was the development of a rocket motor system for the four stages of the vehicle. The critical problems in the completion of this task were, 
making an 8.6-ton propellant grain and a high-mass ratio Apogee rocket motor system which would use high-energy propellants. Another task was vehicle control and guidance. Three types of control systems were involved in this task aerodynamic surface control, thrust vector control and reaction control for the first, second, and third stages and the spin-up mechanism for the fourth stage. Inertial reference for control systems and guidance through inertial measurement was also imperative. Yet another major task was the augmentation of launch facilities at Char with systems integration and checkout facilities and development of launch support systems such as launchers and vehicle assembly fixtures. A target of all line flight test within 64 months was set in March 1973. I took up the executive responsibility of implementing the project within the framework of policy decisions taken, the approved management plan, and the project report, and also within the budget and through the powers delegated to me by the director, VSSC. Dr. Brahm Prakash formed four project advisory committees to advise me on specialized areas like rocket motors, materials, and fabrication, control and guidance, electronics, and mission and launching. I was assured of the guidance of outstanding scientists like D.S. Rana, Muthanayagam, T.S. Pravlad, A.R. Acharya, S.C. Gupta, and C.L. Ambarao, to name a few. The Holy Quran says, We have sent down to you revelations showing you an account of those who have gone before you and an admonition to righteous men. I sought to share the wisdom of these extremely brilliant people. Light upon light. Allah guides to his light whom he will. He has knowledge of all things. We made three groups to carry out the project activities a program management group, an integration and flight testing group and a subsystems development group. The first group was made responsible for looking after the overall executive aspects of SLV3, project management including administration, planning and evaluation, subsystem specifications, materials, fabrication, quality assurance and control. The integration and flight testing group was assigned the tasks of generation of facilities required for integration and flight testing of SLV-3. They were also asked to carry out the analysis of the vehicle, including mechanical and aerodynamic interface problems. The subsystems development group was given the job of interacting with various divisions of VSSC and was made responsible for ensuring that all technological problems in the development of various subsystems were overcome by creating a synergy amongst the available talent in these divisions. I projected a requirement of 275 engineers and scientists for SLV3 but could get only about 50. If it had not been for synergistic efforts, the whole project would have remained a non-starter. Some young engineers like M. S. R. Dev, G. Madhvan Nair, S. Srinivasan, U. S. Singh, Sundar Rajan, Abdul Majid, V. E. D. Prakash Sandlas, Nambudairi, Sussi Kumar and Shivathanupalai developed their own ground rules designed to help them work efficiently as a project team, and produced outstanding individual and team results. These men were in the habit of celebrating their successes together in a sort of mutual appreciation club. This boosted morale, and helped them a great deal to accept setbacks and to revitalize themselves after periods of intense work. Each member of the SLV3 project team was a specialist in his own field. It was natural therefore that each one of them valued his independence. To manage the performance of such specialists the team leader has to adopt a delicate balance between the hands-on and the hands-off approach. The hands-on approach takes an active interest on a very regular basis in the members' work. The hands-off approach trusts team members and recognizes their need for autonomy to carry out their roles, as they see fit. It hinges on their self-motivation. When the leader goes too far with the hands-on approach, he is seen as an anxious and interfering type. If he goes too far hands off, he is seen as abdicating his responsibility or not being interested. Today, the members of the SLV3 team have grown to lead some of the country's most prestigious programs. MSR Dev heads the Augmented Satellite Launch Vehicle, ASLV, project, Mothvan Nair is the chief of the Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, PSLV, Project and Sandlas and Shivathanukalai are chief controllers in DRDO headquarters. 
Each one of these men rose to his present position through consistent hard work and rock-like willpower. It was indeed an exceptionally talented team. Having taken up the leadership of executing the SLV-3 project, I faced urgent and conflicting demands on my time for committee work, material procurement, correspondence, reviews, briefings, and for the need to be informed on a wide range of subjects. My day would start with a stroll of about 2 km around the lodge I was living in. I used to prepare a general schedule during my morning walk, and emphasize two or three things I would definitely like to accomplish during the day, including at least one thing that would help achieve long-term goals. Once in the office, I would clean the table first. Within the next 10 minutes, I would scan all the papers and quickly divide them into different categories, those that required immediate action, low-priority ones, ones that could be kept pending, and reading material. Then I would put the high-priority papers in front of me and everything else out of sight. Coming back to SLV3, about 250 sub-assemblies and 44 major subsystems were conceived during the design. The list of materials went up to over 1 million components. A project implementation strategy had become essential to achieve sustained viability of this complex program of 7 to 10 years duration. From his side, Professor Thuvan came up with a clear statement that all the manpower and funds at VSSC and SHAR would have to be directed to us. From our side, we evolved a matrix type of management to achieve productive interfacing with more than 300 industries. The target was that our interaction with them must lead to their technology empowerment. Three things I stressed before my colleagues' importance of design capability, goal setting and realization, and the strength to withstand setbacks. Now, before I dwell on the finer aspects of the management of the SLV3 project, let me talk about the SLV3 itself. It is interesting to describe a launch vehicle anthropomorphically. The main mechanical structure may be visualized as the body of a human being, the control and guidance systems with their associated electronics constitute the brain. The musculature comes from propellants. How are they made? What are the materials and techniques involved? A large variety of materials go into the making of a launch vehicle both metallic and non-metallic, which include composites and ceramics. In metals, different types of stainless steel, alloys of aluminium, magnesium, titanium, copper, beryllium, tungsten, and molybdenum are used. Composite materials are composed of a mixture or combination of two or more constituents which differ in form and material composition and which are essentially insoluble in one another. The materials which combine may be metallic, organic, or inorganic. While other material combinations possible are virtually unlimited, the most typical composites in launch vehicles are made of structural constituents, embedded in a matrix. We used a large variety of glass fiber reinforced plastic composites and opened avenues for the entry of Kevlar, polyamides and carbon-carbon composites. Ceramics are special types of baked clay. Used for microwave transparent enclosures. We considered using ceramics, but had to reject the idea then due to technological limitations. Through mechanical engineering, these materials are transformed into hardware. In fact, of all the engineering disciplines which feed directly into the development of rocketry, mechanical engineering is perhaps the most intrinsic one. Be it a sophisticated system like a liquid engine or a piece of hardware as simple as a fastener, its ultimate fabrication calls for expert mechanical engineers and precision machine tools. We decided to develop important technologies like welding techniques for low alloy stainless steel, electroforming techniques, and ultra precision process tooling. We also decided to make some important machines in house, like the 254 liter vertical mixer and the groove machining facility for our third and fourth stages. Many of our subsystems were so massive and complex that they implied sizable financial outlays. Without any hesitation, we approached industries in the private sector and developed contract management plans which later became blueprints for many government-run science and technology business organizations. Coming to the life part of the SLV, there is the complex electrical circuitry, which sets the mechanical structure in motion. 
This vast spectrum of activities, encompassing simple electrical power supplies to sophisticated instrumentation as well as guidance and control systems is collectively referred to in aerospace research as avionics. Development efforts in avionic systems had already been initiated at VSSC in the field of digital electronics, microwave radars, and radar transponders, and inertial components and systems. It is very important to know the state of the SLV when it is in flight. SLV brought a new surge of activity in the development of a variety of transducers for measurement of physical parameters like pressure, thrust, vibration, acceleration, etc. The transducers convert the physical parameters of the vehicle into electrical signals. An onboard telemetry system processes these signals suitably and transmits them in the form of radio signals to the ground stations, where they are received and deciphered back to the original information collected by the transducers. If the systems work according to design there is little cause for concern, but in case something goes wrong, the vehicle must be destroyed to stop it from making any unexpected moves. To ensure safety, a special telecommand system was made to destroy the rocket in case it malfunctions, and an interferometer system was developed to determine the range and position of the SLV, as an added means to the radar system. The SLV project also initiated the indigenous production of sequencers which time the various events, such as ignition, stage separation, vehicle altitude programmers which store the information for the rocket maneuvers, and autopilot electronics which take appropriate decisions to steer the rocket along its predetermined path. Without the energy to propel the whole system, a launch vehicle remains grounded. A propellant is usually a combustible substance that produces heat and supplies ejection particles in a rocket engine. It is both a source of energy and a working substance for expanding energy. Because the distinction is more decisive in rocket engines, the term propellant is used primarily to describe chemicals carried by rockets for propulsive purposes. It is customary to classify propellants as either solids or liquids. We concentrated on solid propellants. A solid propellant consists essentially of three components, the oxidizer, the fuel, and the additives. Solid propellants are further classified into two types, composite and double base. The former consists of an oxidizer or inorganic material, like ammonium perchlorate, in a matrix of organic fuel, like synthetic rubber. Double base propellants were distant dreams those days but nevertheless we dared to dream about them. All this self-sufficiency and indigenous manufacture came gradually, and not always without pain. We were a team of almost self-trained engineers. In retrospect I feel the unique blend of our untutored talent, character, and dedication suited SLV development the most. Problems surfaced regularly and almost consistently. But my team members never exhausted my patience. I recall writing after winding up a late night shift. Beautiful hands are those that do work that is earnest and brave and true moment by moment. The long day through. Almost parallel to our work on SLV, the DRDO was preparing itself for developing an indigenous surface-to-air missile. The RATO project was abandoned because the aircraft for which it was designed became obsolete. The new aircraft did not need RATO. With the project called off, Narayanan was DRDO's logical choice to lead the team for making the missile. Unlike us at ISRO, they preferred the philosophy of one-to-one -one substitution rather than technology development and performance upgrading. The surface-to-air missile SA-2 of Russian origin was chosen to acquire detailed knowledge of all the design parameters of a proven missile and to establish, thereby, the necessary infrastructure required in the organization. It was thought that once one-to-one -one indigenization was established, further advances in the sophisticated field of guided missiles would be a natural fallout. The project was sanctioned in February 1972 with the code name Devil and funding of about 5 rupees crore was made available for the first three years. Almost half of it was to go in foreign exchange. By now promoted to Air Commodore, Narayanan took over as director, DRDL. He mobilized this young laboratory located in the southeastern suburbs of Hyderabad to take up this enormous task. 
the landscape dotted with tombs and old buildings started reverberating with new life. Narayanan was a man of tremendous energy a man always. In the boost phase, he gathered around him a strong group of enthusiastic people, drawing many service officers into this predominantly civilian laboratory. Totally preoccupied with the SLV affairs, my participation in the missile panel meetings gradually dwindled, and then stopped altogether. However, stories about Narayanan and his devil were beginning to reach Trivandrum. A transformation of an unprecedented scale was taking place there. During my association with Narayanan in the RATO project, I had discovered that he was a hard taskmaster one who went all out for control, mastery, and domination. I used to wonder if managers like him, who aim at getting results no matter what the price, would face a rebellion of silence and non-cooperation in the long run. New Year's Day, 1975, brought with it an opportunity to have a first-person assessment of the work going on under Narayanan's leadership. Professor M. G. K. Mainon, who was working then as scientific advisor to the defense minister and was head of the DRDO, appointed a review committee under the chairmanship of Dr. Brahm Prakash to evaluate the work carried out in the DEVIL project. I was taken into the team as a rocket specialist to evaluate the progress made in the areas of aerodynamics, structure, and propulsion of the missile. On the propulsion aspects, I was assisted by B. R. Somangsekar and by W. G. C. D. R. P. Kumraju. The committee members included Dr. R. P. Shinwoy and Professor I. G. Sarma who were to review the work done on the electronic systems. We met at DRDL on 1 and January 2, 1975, followed by a second session after about six weeks. We visited the various development work centers and held discussions with the scientists there. I was greatly impressed by the vision of A. V. Rangarao, the dynamism of W. G. C. D. R. R. Gopalaswamy, the thoroughness of Dr. I. Achyadarao, the enterprise of G. Ganesan, S. Krishnan's clarity of thought and R. Balakrishnan's critical eye for detail. The calm of J. C. Bhattacharya and L. T. C. O. L. R. Svaminathan in the face of immense complexities was striking. The zeal and application of L. T. C. O. L. V. J. Sundaram was conspicuous. They were a brilliant, committed group of people a mix of service officers and civilian scientists who had trained themselves in the areas of their own interest out of their driving urge to fly an Indian missile. We had our concluding meeting towards the end of March 1975 at Trivandrum. We felt that the progress in the execution of the project was adequate in respect of hardware fabrication to carry out the philosophy of one-to-one -one substitution of missile subsystems except in the liquid rocket area, where some more time was required to succeed. The committee was of the unanimous opinion that DRDL had achieved the twin goals of hardware fabrication and system analysis creditably in the design and development of the ground electronics complex assigned to them. We observed that the one-to-one -one substitution philosophy had taken precedence over the generation of design data. Consequently, many design engineers had not been able to pay adequate attention to the necessary analysis which was the practice followed by us at VSSC. The system analysis studies carried out up to then had also been only of a preliminary nature. In all, the results accomplished were outstanding, but we still had a long way to go. I recalled a school poem. Don't worry and fret, faint-hearted, the chances have just begun. For the best jobs haven't been started, the best work hasn't been done. The committee made a strong recommendation to the government to give Devil a further go-ahead. Our recommendation was accepted and the project proceeded. Back home at VSSC, SLV was taking shape. In contrast to the DRDL which was sprinting ahead, we were moving slowly. Instead of following the leader, my team was trekking towards success on several individual paths. The essence of our method of work was an emphasis on communication, particularly in the lateral direction, among the teams and within the teams. In a way, communication was my mantra for managing this gigantic project. To get the best from my team members, I spoke to them frequently on the goals and objectives of the organization, emphasizing the importance of each member's specific contribution towards the realization of these goals. At the same time, 
I tried to be receptive to every constructive idea emanating from my subordinates and to relay it in an appropriate form for critical examination and implementation. I had written somewhere in my diary of that period. If you want to leave your footprints on the sands of time. Do not drag your feet. Most of the time, communication gets confused with conversation. In fact, the two are distinctly different. I was, and am, a terrible conversationalist but consider myself a good communicator. A conversation full of pleasantries is most often devoid of any useful information, whereas communication is meant only for the exchange of information. It is very important to realize that communication is a two-party affair which aims at passing on or receiving a specific piece of information. While working on the SLV, I used communication to promote understanding and to come to an agreement with colleagues in defining the problems that existed and in identifying the action necessary to be taken to solve them. Authentic communication was one of the tools skillfully used in managing the project. How did I do that? To begin with, I tried to be factual and never sugarcoated the bitter pill of facts. At one of the Space Science Council, SSC, review meetings, frustrated by the procurement delays, I erupted into an agitated complaint against the indifference and red tape tactics of the controller of accounts and financial advisor of VSSC. I insisted that the systems of work followed by the accounts staff had to change and demanded the delegation of their functions to the project team. Dr. Brahm Prakash was taken aback by the bluntness of my submission. He stubbed out his cigarette and walked out of the meeting. I spent the whole night regretting the pain my harsh words had caused Dr. Brahm Prakash. However, I was determined to fight the inertia built into the system before I found myself being dragged down with it. I asked myself a practical question, could one live with these insensitive bureaucrats? The answer was a big no. Then I asked myself a private question, what would hurt Dr. Brahm Prakash more, my seemingly harsh words now, or the burial of the SLV at a later stage? Finding my head and heart agreeing, I prayed to God for help. Fortunately for me, Dr. Brahm Prakash delegated financial powers to the project the next morning. Anyone who has taken up the responsibility to lead a team can be successful only if he is sufficiently independent, powerful, and influential in his own right to become a person to reckon with. This is perhaps also the path to individual satisfaction in life, for freedom with responsibility is the only sound basis for personal happiness. What can one do to strengthen personal freedom? I would like to share with you two techniques I adopt in this regard. First, by building your own education and skills. Knowledge is a tangible asset, quite often the most important tool in your work. The more up-to-date the knowledge you possess, the freer you are. Knowledge cannot be taken away from anyone except by obsolescence. A leader can only be free to lead his team if he keeps abreast of all that is happening around him in real time. To lead, in a way, is to engage in continuing education. In many countries, it is normal for professionals to go to college several nights every week. To be a successful team leader, one has to stay back after the din and clutter of a working day to emerge better equipped and ready to face a new day. The second way is to develop a passion for personal responsibility. The sovereign way to personal freedom is to help determine the forces that determine you. Be active. Take on responsibility. Work for the things you believe in. If you do not, you are surrendering your fate to others. The historian Edith Hamilton wrote of ancient Greece, when the freedom they wished for most was freedom from responsibility, then Athens ceased to be free and was never free again. The truth is that there is a great deal that most of us can individually do to increase our freedom. We can combat the forces that threaten to oppress us. We can fortify ourselves with the qualities and conditions that promote individual freedom. In doing so, we help to create a stronger organization, capable of achieving unprecedented goals. As work on the SLV gained momentum, Professor Thuban introduced the system of reviewing progress with the entire team involved in the project. Professor Thuban was a man with a mission. 
he would effortlessly pull together all the loose ends to make work move smoothly. At VSSC the review meetings presided over by Professor Thuvan used to be considered major events. He was a true captain of the ISRO ship a commander, navigator, housekeeper, all rolled into one. Yet, he never pretended to know more than he did. Instead, when something appeared ambiguous, he would ask questions and discuss his doubts frankly. I remember him as a leader for whom to lead with a firm, but fair hand, was a moral compulsion. His mind used to be very firm once it had been decided on any issue. But before taking a decision, it used to be like clay, open to impressions until the final molding. Then the decisions would be popped into the potter's oven for glazing, never failing to emerge. Hard and tough, resistant and enduring. I had the privilege of spending a great deal of time with Professor Thuvan. He could hold the listener enthralled because of the logical, intellectual acumen he could bring to bear on his analysis of any subject. He had an unusual combination of degrees a Bachelor's of Science in Mathematics and Physics, an MA in English Literature, BE in Mechanical Engineering, MS in Aeronautical Engineering followed by a PhD in Aeronautics and Mathematics from the California Institute of Technology, Caltech, in USA. Intellectual debates with him were very stimulating and could always mentally energize me and my team members. I found him full of optimism and compassion. Although he often judged himself harshly, with no allowances or excuses, he was generous to a fault when it came to others. Professor Thuvan used to sternly pronounce his judgments and then pardon the contrite guilty parties. In 1975, ISRO became a government body. An ISRO council was formed consisting of directors of different work centers and senior officers in the Department of Space, DOS. This provided a symbolic link as well as a forum for participative management between the DOS which had the governmental powers and the centers which would execute the jobs. In the traditional parlance of government departments, ISRO centers would have been subordinate units or attached offices, but such words were never spoken either at ISRO or DOS. Participative management, which calls for active interaction between those who wield administrative powers and the executing agencies, was a novel feature of ISRO management that would go a long way in Indian R&D organizations. The new setup brought me in contact with T.N. Seshan, the joint secretary in the DOS. Till then, I had a latent reservation about bureaucrats, so I was not very comfortable when I first saw Seshan participating in a SLV3 management board meeting. But soon, it changed to admiration for Seshan, who would meticulously go through the agenda and always come for the meetings prepared. He used to kindle the minds of scientists with his tremendous analytical capability. The first three years of the SLV project was the period for the revelation of many fascinating mysteries of science. Being human, ignorance has always been with us, and always will be. What was new was my awareness of it, my awakening to its fathomless dimensions. I used to erroneously suppose that the function of science was to explain everything, and that unexplained phenomena were the province of people like my father and Lakshmana Sastari. However, I always refrained from discussing these matters with any of my scientist colleagues, fearing that it would threaten the hegemony of their meticulously formed views. Gradually, I became aware of the difference between science and technology, between research and development. Science is inherently open-ended and exploratory. Development is a closed loop. Mistakes are imperative in development and are made every day, but each mistake is used for modification, upgradation, or betterment. Probably, the creator created engineers to make scientists achieve more. For each time scientists come up with a thoroughly researched and fully comprehended solution, engineers show them yet another lumenu, yet one more possibility. I cautioned my team against becoming scientists. Science is a passion and never-ending voyage into promises and possibilities. We had only limited time and limited funds. Our making the SLV depended upon our awareness of our own limits. 
I preferred existing workable solutions which would be the best options. Nothing that is new comes into time-bound projects without its own problems. In my opinion, a project leader should always work with proven technologies in most of the systems as far as possible and experiment only from multiple resources.